you very much. Good afternoon. Thanks for giving me 15 minutes of your time. I'm going to try and be really useful to you by keeping it short and simple and trying to persuade you of two things, neither of which is in my commercial interest. I'm going to tell you about Droplet, um, but I thought as you've made such an effort to come here, I won't bang on too much about what we're doing. I'm going to show you a very short video. And instead, I want to talk to you about innovation, because that's kind of what I've been doing for the last 10 years as a startup entrepreneur. Droplet is my fifth. I've had one good, two bad, one ugly, and this one. And this one's going to be the really good one. Um, but innovation is the thing that gets me really excited. And innovation is one of those interesting words. It kind of means everything and nothing. And uh, to me, it's all about invention. That's what I'm doing in technology. I'm inventing things, or me and my co-founders are inventing things. And uh, this talk really is about other people who are smarter than me uh, saying things that you can digest in nugget form, one of whom is Albert Einstein. Uh, but before I even go on to talk about Albert Einstein, uh, I want to share with you a Douglas Adams quote that might bring some of this back down to ground level. And you might have heard of this before. He says on innovation, anything which is invented before you're five years old grows up being part of your normal life. Anything which is invented between the ages of 15 and 30 is the thing which is undoubtedly going to change the world. You could probably get a career in it. And anything that's invented after you're 30 is a pointless, baffling waste of time. And if you're anything like me, then you probably feel that about some of the things that you see in marketing. And really, I think one of the reasons for this is we've all got a bit carried away with innovation. We're always trying to add the next layer to make something different, thinking that by making it different, we're making it better. And the first thing I want to try and persuade you of is that now, possibly unlike when Einstein said this, innovation really in the worlds that we work in is about taking steps away, taking things away. So Einstein's talking about thinking at a higher level. I'm talking about delivering lower down, closer to ground, closer to the human level that we all really, if we're honest with each other, probably prefer to exist at. And so the next level in a lot of innovation to me feels like this. It feels like companies that are looking for ways to build extra complication on top of what's already there, because we're all told about building added value, and that means building stuff on top, on top, and on top, because if we build something on top and no one else got it, then we can sell it and make money. That's kind of the business model. Um, and I think a lot can be learned from um, the paradox of the drug company here. To me, drug companies are never really interested in solving the problem completely. They don't want a cure. They just want a slightly better remedy. And in our world, the business world that we've interrupted or tried to disrupt, I'm using that phrase very carefully, the incumbents that really are not looking for a cure but for a slightly better remedy are the payments companies. You've seen them. They've invented things that are great, like contactless, and things that are great, like Apple Pay. But what they're not about to do is get rid of payments because they make their money out of payments. And it was this strength of having nothing invested in it at all when we started that gave us the ability to do something that I think is both innovative and also reductively simpler. I'll see if you agree. So, Albert Einstein again. I'm going to read this to you because I love this. The gift of fantasy has meant more to me than my talent for absorbing positive knowledge. I.e. facts are great, but imagination is more important. Or as I inferred from this when I first saw it, it doesn't matter if you have no idea what you're doing at the beginning. And in fact, having no idea what you're doing is quite a strong competitive advantage when you're trying to change something for the better. I really believe that. And I definitely know that right at the beginning, we knew nothing about what we were doing. But knowing nothing about what we were doing in payments was a great strength, because these guys all thought they knew what they were doing. Now, you may or may not have heard of some of these projects. Some of them didn't ever see the light of day. Some of them cost hundreds of millions of pounds before they launched, got it wrong, and were shut down again just as quickly, because these guys thought they knew what they were doing, but actually they didn't. And so when we first started Droplet, what we were looking for is a way of improving customer experience with payments and making things better for the end user. We weren't looking for a new way to add a slightly innovative layer on top of the existing payments options that people have. That sounds like a slightly nuanced difference. It doesn't mean much. I think it means quite a lot. And I want to talk to you about Droplet because it's through this journey that I feel I can speak with any degree of relevance on the issue of innovation and what this has meant for us. But this is what we've ended up doing. We've ended up inventing a payment system that doesn't actually need you to do anything. You walk into a merchant that you go to all the time, you're a regular, and 
by virtue of you walking into that space, they're able to see you, charge you, and reward you seamlessly behind the scenes. We've managed to wangle a trademark on the phrase zero touch, which I'm kind of proud of because we did it ourselves. Zero touch is uh, what we call our product or the way that it works. And people seem to really like it. We're an early stage tech company, just like Justin. That's kind of why I'm here talking to you. But this really seems to be going well. Why is it different and why is it working? Well, I think what we looked for when we first started was a way in which you could make things simpler and more human. And if you think back to the days, those of you who can remember, where you used to run accounts with small businesses, you'd go into a business that you knew, they'd recognize you by face, and rather than having some sort of rigmarole where you're not allowed to leave until you've paid the bill, they just note down what you'd bought on an account. They send it to you later on, and you settle the account. Buying things on account is how I used to do business when I ran a pub in North Norfolk 15 years ago, but that's a completely different story. And we wanted to bring that same level of simplicity to the world of payments. Not because we thought it was going to be a necessarily better way of making money out of payments, but because we thought that by taking something away, we could make something that worked better for the end user. So what happened when we took payments away? When we were a payments company trying to do ourselves out of the payments business by removing the step altogether? Well, the first thing we saw was that payments ceased being an interruption for the customer. They didn't have to touch or tap or swipe or scan anything. They could just come in, enjoy the product or the environment, or enjoy it really quickly and then get on with their day. And that led to some really interesting indications from our users that what we were really doing was improving customer experience. In a slow service environment, we were allowing them more time and space to enjoy talking to the person that was serving them. In a fast service environment, they were enjoying being able to get the stuff and go quicker than ever before. So what we realized is that we quite quickly ceased being a payments business, and we'd started dabbling in loyalty as well, and we'd started to become a customer experience business. And this is where I think the majority of innovation that's relevant to the sorts of people who are at this festival really kicks in. Innovation should really be not for technology's sake, or even really for your sake to make things cheaper. It should be for your customer's sake to improve customer experience. And this is where I think the best opportunities for innovation really come from. Innovating to improve customer experience means making more space for conversations. You can see how a lot of the social media innovations of the last decade have innovated in customer experience by making more space for conversations between brands or businesses and their customers. Customer experience means putting the customer at the heart of the experience, which is hollow rhetoric on its own. But to me, that means making it more human and bringing it back down to that ground level, possibly even back as far as in the 1980s, buying things on account over the counter. And customer experience means recognizing that in a digitally connected world, we all still have a very strong and powerful sense of place. The sense of localism, the sense of our locality, where we're from, where we work, where we go. I think this is growing in its strength and significance to people, which is why location-based apps are really on the rise. And why apps like ours that promote people to spend locally also appear to be getting really good uptake just because they're about the, set, the local place. They're about being able to shop and spend and live in the area that we come from. So that's all really helped us to get going. The difference and where innovation really comes in is how you can use technology and data. And in our business, the bit that we charge for is the invisible bit in the background. The way that we now know who's buying what, not just what's being bought. And we can empower merchants from tiny one-person bands through to medium-sized chains to use that sort of intelligence to better personalize the way they speak to their customers. Really simply, that is sending the right messages electronically to the right people, only sending them stuff they're interested in, or even in the store, being able to prompt the person serving them on the screen in front of them so that they know the sort of thing this customer usually buys, or they could recommend something to give them for free that they might like. This sort of data is what can empower and enhance and uphold customer relationships without being spooky and weird and spammy and stalky. And that's the kind of sweet spot that we're aiming for. So I'm almost done but I want to show you what this looks like. This is a 90-second video that will just explain what Droplet is, because I have one more thing I'm going to try and persuade you of, as well as the idea that real innovation is about taking things away, not adding to the top of the stack. I'll show you this video, and I'll end on that point. Who'd have thought we'd end up with such power in our pockets? Smartphones have entered our lives in ways we never expected, and smart people are using their phones to do more of the things they love and make life run that little bit more smoothly. Droplet is a mobile payments app that does just that. It's easy to get started. Just add a payment card 
and you're ready to go. The first time you spend in a place you'll need to tap pay here so your favourite merchants can charge you. After that you'll simply get a push notification of how much you've spent. No more fumbling, scanning, swiping or tapping. Just pay and enjoy. You can also collect loyalty stamps as you go. No need to carry around lots of different cards. You can see where your next reward is coming from, right there on your phone. We started Droplet because we believed we could use the power of the web to transform the world of payments. It's secure, simple, and unlike every other payment system in the world, Droplet is completely transaction fee free for everyone. Our friendly ambassadors are helping take Droplet out across the country. Download the app now to see what they're so excited about. And if you're a business, just visit our website to join up. Droplet, powering a quiet revolution at the corner of your street. And so the second question, or, or the second thing I'm going to try and persuade you of lastly this afternoon, is really what this means for you. How can you do this in your businesses, in your organisations, whether you're big or small or medium sized? And I think this is all about what you believe innovation is really about. If you believe the first thing, and you can take things away to make them simpler, you'll find easy solutions if you can put yourselves in the shoes of your customer and work out where they're pinching. And most importantly, what's your killer disease? What thing at the moment are you trying to prevent really being solved? And this is the second thing I'm going to try and persuade you of, is that unless you actually intend to put your current business out of business, innovation to your company is something that's just done on the sides. It's not a real thing that's about transforming things for the future. And if you see innovation as transforming things in the long term, not just trying to add a bit of PR ability or innovation or excitement in the short term, then you will want to find the thing that will completely remove the current problem that you're solving and look for something different to solve in the long term. That's my opinion. Thanks for listening. So before we go, any questions from the audience before we go to the screen? Just going to jump to the back mm. and then. I was just wondering if there was any point of sale integration in, involved in the payments. There can be. It can be run standalone or it can be integrated with the till. So at the moment we're working through a list of partners getting it baked right into the till system. That's going to be a significant piece of work, obviously. Uh, it's funny. It depends how they're configured. Some systems is really hard. Um, some is kind of a day's work. It, it really depends massively on the tech. Okay. Thank you. If you know anyone, I'm interested in talking to them though from till companies. <laughs> it was interesting the video. I'm not quite sure whether I get how it works. Ah. So, so I don't know if it was me just not understanding it. So the person behind the counter, how do they charge your... They account? press your face. When you enter the space, you appear, they press your face, they type in the amount and they press charge and you get a little push to your pocket. And then in doing that, they can choose to reward you or give you stamps or anything like that. Yeah, it's kind of easier to just try it out. I know it's a really lazy thing to say, because I'm also looking for app downloads, but try it out. That feels <laughs> like it'd work in a smaller places rather than the larger retail outlets. Yeah, it's kind of for the place that you go frequently. That's the thing. So we've, we've tried it across all sorts of different size businesses. Um, every business has to have a point of sale at the end of the day if it's trading over the counter. And yeah, it's more complicated in more sophisticated environments. But it, does, it works in big, like, multi-point, multi-till point sales places. It doesn't work in supermarkets. useless for that sort of thing. Um, but anywhere where you're being given something over a counter, um, it's worked really well. They're still doing all that through the till. So they're doing it through the till, and a bit like when the credit card machine was separate, they're then keying the amount into Droplet, <coughs> charging you, and then closing it off on the till. Hence the till integration being a, a thing that we're doing in the future. I can, I can show you something that will probably answer the question much better afterwards. I'm going to go uh, one on the screen, Steph. So talk about the top one, which is uh, what's to stop accidental charges. Yeah, it's fascinating. So in a, in a way, Droplet works in exactly the same way as Uber. You know you've kind of been charged when you get the push notification, and by that time the driver's probably halfway down the street. And it is absolutely amazing, but we've only had two incidents since we launched in May. We've got over 23,000 users. We only had two incidents where we've had to refund a customer. Every single other example of where it's sort of gone wrong or someone's been overcharged has been resolved at the point of sale and resolved amicably. 
Um, if you as a customer see a transaction that you think is a problem, you just press report a problem, a bit like on iTunes. And we always underwrite, we always guarantee the customers, but we've only had to ever get involved twice. And I guess that's because in the same way as if you're a business with a loyal customer, you're not going to cheat them out of change if they give you a tenner and you give them five pounds worth of change. The customer comes back and says, oh, I gave you a tenner. And if they're a regular customer on whose frequent visit you depend, you're going to take their word for it. And I think that's probably why the incidents of us having to intervene have been so low. It's a risk we were really pleased to see play out much lower than we thought it would. OK, I think we're out of time. Is anyone else on the floor? Just do one, one last one. So how, how do you secure the registration piece? So when I walk into that shop and they're going to identify me, how do you stop them in the middle of tax? So from a fraud we, perspective? How, from a fraud perspective, I guess we're relying mostly on the social fact that you're much more careful about your phone and where it is than you are about anything else that you've ever owned in the past. Um, we use three different geolocation technologies to validate where somebody is one of which requires them to have actively authenticated recently. So there's quite a few different things that are done in the background. It's a bit like a search engine. When a search engine ranks the order of results on a search engine results page, it's looking at 200 different signals to work out what to put where. We're looking at, admittedly, not 200, but a bunch of different signals to work out reliably, accurately, and securely who is where and who's in the shop. Yeah. How do you know that? So if I, if I walk in the store yeah. and there's a Wi-Fi signal, say it's O2 Wi-Fi, how do I get to know that? I, I can repudiate that it's you actually joining as a merchant. I'm not sure I understand, but I will answer that afterwards. That's okay. okay. The merchant knows because of your face, but I'll, I'll come and talk to you afterwards. I cool. think we're out of time, unfortunately. So uh, any questions afterwards, uh, come up to the top. So thanks. Thanks, thanks for having Steph. me. Thank Cheers. You.